Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study, our book of Romans chapter 2 today. We're going to get into here in a moment. The thing is, our Father is saying, I have created the earth in a natural way. And in, in certain things, if you just look at nature itself, that's God's way. And... Um, he said, don't, don't, even somebody that doesn't have the word can tell by my creation kind of the way I feel about things. And that is very true. Uh, God is, is not only natural, he's supernatural. Chapter 2, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. What does he say to we, his children? Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgeth. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same things. In other words, everyone breaks a law occasionally. It may not be the same law. But it's very difficult, according to even nature and God's natural laws, that um, there's the food laws and you name it, but you, you want to be careful because uh, there's nobody perfect. And when... When you realize that um, our Father is the judge, he doesn't want you judging people. I do not want you to do away with spiritual discernment. That's a gift from God, is to be able to, be able to discern what is right from wrong. But at the same time, do not judge people. Leave that in God's court. He can handle it. He's quite capable. Verse 2. But we are sure, or this we know, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. That is to say, man's judgment might mess up, but God's judgment is right on, and, and God's judgment is against people that break his rules, the rules of nature and the rules of law. Verse, and thinkest thou this, O man that judgeth them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, when he knows everything, he understands everything. In other words, you, the, one of the greatest sins is to judge somebody. And certainly um, uh, never be caught guilty of that. Our, our Father is the judge. He even knows inside man's mind what he's thinking. We don't know that. God does. So leave judgment to him, and you simply utilize spiritual discernment and do the very best you can. Verse 4, Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. In other words, our Father is long-suffering. That's why you want to leave judgment to him. You can read that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, that God is long-suffering, and he, it is his wish that all come to repentance. They won't, but it is his wish that they would, and he's long-suffering, meaning he's got lots of patience. And... Um, uh, and when it's time, he corrects a little here, corrects some there, thumps a little gourd here, and uh, he's quite capable in a natural way of handling situations. Verse 5, But after thy hardness and impentant heart treasureth up unto, the, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous, ju righteous judgment of God. And, and so it is. When, when you break away and when you don't repent, the treasures that you lay up um, are to that day of wrath. God's wrath is going to come. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, there are seven cups. 
and seven vials of wrath in the great book of Revelation. And they're going to be dumped out. They're going to be poured out. Uh, it won't be a very pleasant thing to have one of them poured out upon you. That is to say, judgment of Almighty God. So it's, it's so simple, the love of Christ, that he, in his goodness, gave himself on that cross, that on repentance, these things are washed away from your record, out of, right out of the book of life, whereby you're innocent when you love him. But if you judge people, if you're a hard nose, if you keep after people, you bring nothing but the wrath of God down on your own head. It's, what, what a waste. What a waste. You might even think, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a person of God. Well, really? Not if you judge people. You're per, a pretender. Verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Um, you might say, well, then God certainly must be this, that. No, no that's, not why, that's not how he judges. Did you not read that? It says, he renders to every man according to his deeds, not somebody else's. God judges you by your own actions. And you're going to get everything you got coming to you. If it's blessings, it is blessings. And if it, if, if it is correction, you can rest assured you're going to get it. Because your own deeds set your sentence. That's why Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. And on repentance of the cross, it's washed away. It's forgiven. And certainly those, uh, the deeds that are left are good. And, and uh, they bring righteousness to you, not correction. So God is that way. He will see that everybody receives what they have coming to them. But it is your own self, not somebody else, that uh, uh, accomplishes your deeds. Therefore, your deeds you will answer for. Verse 7, to them who be patient, continuance in Continuance in well-doing, seek uh, for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Uh, to them that be patient, in other words, if you've got uh, a little common sense and you patiently uh, follow God's rules as best you can and you pray, you talk to him and, and um, your repentant or repentant heart, washes away all that that is evil around you, that is negative, and leaves you that light that shines in the darkness, which is to say the presence of the Holy Spirit itself. Verse 8, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, you know what happens to them? Verse 9, Tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Remember, there's no difference. You are judged by your own deeds, whether you're an Israelite or whether you're a Gentile. You, 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 um, you're saddled with your own deeds, and you're going to get everything you got coming to you. Hopefully it's good. Hopefully you got blessings coming to you on payday rather than correction. Because God's wrath is, is not a pleasant thing at all. Verse 10. <clears throat> On the other hand, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the uh, Gentile, which is to say both to the Israelite and, and to the Gentile, judgment is good to everyone. Judgment is fair to everyone. Everyone is judged by his deeds regardless of who he is. This does not excuse if, if you be one of God's elect of, that, of either of the houses, then you have duties to do. And whom God gives much, he expects much. Verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. And uh, God judges everyone just the same. Now, many might have a little trouble with that. Well, then, 
why are you calling people, if God's not a respecter of persons, how could he choose someone as elect? That he even calls them the elect. Because they didn't, he didn't choose them. Their deeds in the first earth age, they earned the right to have knowledge of the events of the end times. They, have, they um, were God's elect because they earned it. It wasn't given to them. He did not play favorites, for he is not a respecter of persons. But certainly he is a father that honors those that respect him and that follow him. And some, as it's written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age, meaning you stood against Satan even in the first earth age in your spiritual body. And God knows he can count on you and, uh, and can rightfully, uh, as having chosen you, why? Not a respecter of persons, but because you earned it. Verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And, uh, and there you have it, plus the covenant, the covenant of the living God. You're, you're going to answer for, for that that you chose. 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Um, um, and, and so it is. Just because you hear the word of God, just because you attend some chapel or church and you hear God's word read, that, that doesn't cut it. You, it's what you do. It, it, you are a doer. And, and to be a doer, that creates your deeds, and your deeds are what you're judged by. It's that simple. Uh, and, and so it is it, in the natural sense. You know, it, it is um, people, what he's saying here, even without the law, you can tell by looking at nature itself what is right from wrong. And, and uh, in the natural sense, and you'll be judged by that. In other words, you can look at God's uh, natural um, um, creation and you can pretty well understand the plan of God because his, his law is good. What does it do? It keeps us out of trouble. You see, the law is good, but man, unfortunately, is bad. He falls short sometimes. And the law helps you, as well as nature itself, to do that that is right. Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. In other words, when they see what is right by nature, many might say, well, well what about the commandments? They don't have the commandments. Oh, well, let's take a family that, um, of Gentiles that have never read the word of God, and you've got a thief in the group. If he steals very much, don't worry, it won't be long in the natural sense. The others are going to check him out. They're going to identify him for what he is. So nature itself documents that that is wrong. And, um, and, and so it is. Uh, God's creation is a beautiful thing when you let nature reign supreme. Next verse, please, verse 15 which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also beareth witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In other words, uh, you can defraud if, you, if you're not real careful of, of, of shortcomings. If you break the laws or you break nature, you, you defraud not only yourself, but your community, your people, your family. You just really don't want to go there. Verse 16, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And, and so it is that um, 
it, uh, that, that day is coming. You can anticipate it, that you are judged the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's Christ's gospel. <clears throat> and his gospel is the good news. Why, when you fall short, would you not repent and have it erased from the book of life? You know, I can understand that some might say, well, how do I know the word is true? Well, the word is true. But even even other than that, if you look at nature itself, it will teach you truth, that that is right and that that is wrong. And, and um, uh, But when, when you do fall short with God's law, you have, according to Christ's gospel, the good news, you have forgiveness, you have understanding, and you have the word of God, the letter that he has written to you that prevents you uh, falling into um, the apostasy, uh, especially in, in, the, uh, in the end times, and um, keeps you free, and free indeed. Verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God. In other words, you, you could do that if you wanted to. If you were an Israelite, you could say, well, I'm, I really... I have the law, and God gave us the covenant, and so forth, 18. And, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. You're being taught. And you, you know what God expects. And when you know what God expects, that elevates you to a place of judgment that you, once you know what he expects, and you can still gain the same thing from nature, I must insist, then you're still accountable in that. Verse 19, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Uh, if, you're, if you're not real careful, you can um, consider yourself as really some kind of leader. And really, you can't even find your own way, much less lead someone else. So that's, that's, um, that is, uh, Christ is our leader, and Christ is our light. And you can reflect that light, but um, how, how careful you must be when you set yourself up as a guide to the blind. That means to set yourself up as to bring someone that knows not the truth into the light of Christ, into the gospel of the living God. Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. And you know what this word, you know what this word uh, form is here? It's morphosis. You know how you morph something? It means it's fake. You, you set yourself up as, as a teacher, and you're, you're no teacher. You, you, you simply morph what you've heard. And, and, in, and in morphing that, you're, quite frankly, um, it's, um, you become a false religion. Well, how can you do that? Why would you want to set yourself up as an instructor of some gospel other than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I mean, that's one sure trip way out of into the eternity forever in the wrong place. But when, when you morph and, and uh, think without the leading of the Holy Spirit into truth and knowledge, then you're a teacher of babes, all right, and they will always be babes even when you finish with them. Because if you're not mature enough to bring in maturity, and if all you can do is more false religion, false beliefs, then you're not going to help anyone, but you're going to hurt a bunch of people. That, that's, that's what he's saying here. And um, uh, unfortunately, you perhaps maybe have been suspicious that there were a lot of morphers around today.
trying to morph the Word of God, and it just doesn't quite make sense because they always include themselves as the great instructor. You, this man's religion and that man's religion rather than God's religion. You know, you know what, well, coming out the gate, I'd be very careful if I worshiped in a religion that carries a man's name instead of Christ. I'd be very careful <clears throat> because some man's trying to draw attention to himself, not the word of God. So we've got a lot of morphing going on. Verse 21, Thou therefore which teacheth another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? <clears throat> In other words, you can very well be a teacher, but if you're morphing, you can steal somebody's birthright, their destiny. You can steal their purpose by not teaching the full truth, by giving them some flyaway doctrine of pie in the sky or something of that nature <clears throat> that absolutely does not exist in the Word of God. And, um, and, and what, what did you do? You teach them not to steal, but you're stealing the truth from them. You're holding them away from the truth, and even that that is natural by saying perversion is okay. Be very careful in this generation, my friend. There are many that morph, and you will never find it in God's word. Verse 22, to continue. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, Dost thou commit sacrilege? Do, do you understand what sacrilege is? Sacrilege, the word in the Greek here, means to rob the temple. Do you think as long as if you're teaching not the word of God, if you're teaching something other than the word of God and claiming it is God's word, <clears throat> do you not understand you're robbing the temple of God? God wants precious souls there that he can judge. God wants precious souls there that the gospel of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is taught to. That on repentance you find salvation. Or in the extreme, even those in nature itself, as long as they follow nature, they'll be blessed by God. He'll count it as a blessing. You can't con God. You can't morph real truth, truth comes from the Word of God, truth comes from the Holy Spirit, and truth is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ which fulfills all commandments. He did not come to change the law, he came to, to fulfill it, to fulfill the Word of God, whereby we in ourselves can have that protection. So what he's saying here, if you're not real careful that um, you um, go against people committing adultery and doing, and you abhor as idols, but at the same time you're robbing the temple by not teaching the real truth of God's word, by morphing falsehoods, by morphing that that leads astray. Hey, he's not a happy camper about that, and he takes it very serious. Are you to judge people on that? No, no, no. You better leave judgment in God's hands or you commit a, a bigger sin than all. Verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonoreth thou God, do, do, and certainly if you break the law, do you dishonor God? The question, 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. In other words, um, uh, if you do not understand God's word, why would you pretend to be a teacher, an instructor is the word he's using here? Because you can, even those that don't know, you can mislead them about what is written. 
what is written, verse 25, for circumcision verily profiteth uh, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. You're, you're no better than a Gentile if you break the law. When, when you know better, because um, um, the naturally, and, and, and I'm, I must insist here now that circumcision has be, is not a, uh, circumcision after Christ's blood was shed on the cross is a thing of the heart, not of the flesh. You do not shed any blood as a, re, a, a religious uh, statute or a symbol or law because circumcision now is of the heart and it applies to both men and women. Okay. Christ shed the last blood that is necessary for the forgiveness of sin. But what, what he's saying here, if you imbib and partake, um, if you break, none of it does you any good if you're going by law, 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? In other words, um, he partakes of the law, and he uh, his the promises of God are fulfilled in that. In other words, again, I, I must insist uh, that circumcision is not necessary. Verse 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. Um, isn't it a fact that, um, that the very heartbreak itself can come from not following God's law? And certainly it is if you have a teacher that would insist on that. So wh what it is is when one breaks nature, then they bring God's wrath down upon themselves. It's no, it, that's the way it is. And certainly to follow God's letter, the, the letter here that he sent to you, we know that Christ changes not the law, but he fulfills it. His blood fulfilled this promise that all in him, the, uh, both the uncircumcision and circumcision, that when by nature they fall under that law and, and uh, participate within it, then they have that blessing of the living God. So you can have people that can morph traditions and make it sound as though it is the Word of God. But when you pull away from the simple truth, what is he saying here? Christ's blood shed on the cross forgives all sin when you repent, when you're penitent. And when you do repent, these things are washed away. And, and, and you are by nature and by law in God's good standing, and you will receive his blessings. And how precious it is to be pleasing to the living God and to have fulfilled his promises uh, and to have received your birthright, and that birthright being to serve the living God. Let's go one more verse, 28. <clears throat> For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outwardly in the flesh. And uh, verse 29, to complete the chapter, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, this is to say of Judah or of the house of Israel, circumcision is that of the heart. In other words, it changes from the flesh to the very heart itself in the spirit. And the Holy Spirit, of course, and man's spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. So don't judge men, but how precious God is that now that that circumcision is of the heart and applying both to man and woman, that the, the main, the moral of this chapter is that you're living in the end times. God created the very nature itself. If you have difficulty understanding God's word, look at nature itself. 
I mean, it will let you know when something is wrong. You have that, that sense that lets you know this is not right. Then you can go to God's Word prayerfully, and He will guide you. The Word will instruct you. But when you have somebody morphing or pretending to be an instructor, pretending to be a church, and they're teaching something other than the gospel of Christ, his forgiveness, leaving judgment to Almighty God. And when you see some religion judging people, I mean judging other churches even, that's something you will never hear as a church judge from this church. That's God's business. You have the right for spiritual discernment to know which one you should attend and shouldn't. But a morpher that morphs, morphs bad words against other religions, you want to mark that ministry because they're morphers. And uh, certainly they're leaving judgment unto themselves and not to God. Our Heavenly Father doesn't like it. So be very careful that you never participate in, in a judgment of others. Leave, you, you do not have that right. God is long-suffering. Who knows what he can do with a ministry or a person in his long-suffering, his patience. He knows when to thump their gourd and get their attention when they break laws or break his word. And he can lovingly, when they talk to him, maybe educate them for, you know, talk about an instructor or a teacher of men. Our Heavenly Father is the best teacher of all with his son, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and certainly uh, leaving judgment to him, following his word as best you can. And when, when you're confused about everything else, then if, 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 um, if you're having difficulty, use common sense and look at the nature. But also you that have the word of God, the beauty of the forgiveness of Christ, penance in him to repent and have his blessings whereby in fact you're a blessing to others. That's what he is after, is a people that will let our Heavenly Father be God, be Yahweh, the God of all, and simply follow as best you can, fulfilling his word in love, in mercy, and in honor. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about another ministry, a reverend, or a um, denomination. We're, we're not going to judge people. We leave that in God's hand. But again, you do have that right for spiritual discernment. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He's very real. He loves you. That's why he created somebody like you. DNA is different. You're unique. 
Let him know you love him. Would you do that, Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. And we're going to go with, um, this would be April. And April, I don't know where April is from. We'll see if we find out here. I have a question. I hope you can help me. My mother passed. It will be two years, October the 1st. I had a dream that she was sitting on my bed. She was patting me on the shoulder and just smiling. I said, Mom, talk to me. And she smiled and disappeared. Well, you know, dreams are personal. And you, uh, I, I do believe that sometimes a loved one wants you to know they're really okay, that they're happy and well. And um, naturally, uh, between a daughter and a mother, they, they um, you can't help but miss. But dreams are something that are personal, and only you that experience it can absolutely interpret it, and uh, so it is. I would say that it shows a great act of love. Dwayne from uh, Virginia, Pastor Murray, thank you for the comment. As taught in God's word, the Antichrist will come on the sixth trump, and Christ will come on the seventh trump. Will we hear all trumps with the human ear, or will it be just a, that we know uh, as the elect at each trump and uh, well, you, you know, that's, you recognize, in other words, the fifth trump. What, what happens in the fifth trump? It's a time of teaching, to teach who the false Christ is, to teach what his name is both in the Greek and in the Hebrew, to teach you the months in which he will appear, May through September. That's the time of the locust in that particular segment of their lives. And um, basically, uh, from from there, so you know you're in the fifth trump because of what's happening there, because that's what's being taught now. And then, as it continues on, you know by the events. That's why you study God's word to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of God to understand the trumps, the vials, the seals. Uh, Janice from Illinois. I am still studying our Father's loving word with you. Thank you. I watch you every day. Okay. I don't know how to reach people. I try to help them understand the truth, but it just seems like they won't listen to anything that I say, have, that I have to say. My sisters and sisters-in-laws believe in the flyaway. Well, the only thing you can do in this case, Father's not ready for everybody. Uh, as you read in Romans chapter 11, some he sent the spirit of stupor upon them, slumber, it is in English. And, and uh, there's nothing we can do about that. They're not going to listen, but you simply living it and having said it, when, you're de when you are delivered up before the false Messiah, then they're going to say, whoa, that was a prophecy she said, and it's coming to pass exactly as she said it would. And then, so you don't push, don't shove, fish like you would if you're fishing for men. Be very gentle, but you're, the way you live it in itself sets a good example. Uh, Linda from New Zealand, when teaching Genesis 126, I think I've heard you say that we are not made in God's image, but we are made in our own image from the first earth age. Is this correct? Yes, that is correct. Let us create man in our plural own image. Uh, if so, does this mean that I was a woman in the first earth age, just as I am now? Why then wouldn't I be a woman in the third earth age? Because we have different bodies in the first earth age, this earth age, and one coming. And as Jesus himself teaches in the third earth age, the reason we don't marry or give it in marriage is because we are all as the angels, meaning we're all in spiritual bodies, and, and we have one head, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which is Emmanuel, which is to say, God with us. And then, and uh, good to hear from you from New Zealand. Um, Adelphia from Florida, I wanted to know if my baby, whom I gave birth at five months and he died as soon as he was born, just with God, 
he didn't get to breathe because his lungs weren't ready. Is it a sin that I named him Emmanuel? No, of course not. And, and, and naturally, he's with the Father because he's innocent. Okay. You know, I, I really feel like that there are some souls that are too good for this earth age from the first earth age. And they get kind of basically a free ride through. I know that may sound even a little painful, but I, I believe that. Uh, because they're, they're, you're, it's only given to once to die, and, and, and your little one has accomplished that. And he's in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's with him. And uh, naturally, he's not a babe there, because in spiritual bodies, we're all the same age. Uh, and uh, bless you. Okay, uh, this would be Pamela from Michigan, Pastor. Thank you for your comments. I am a shut-in, and your program is my church. My question is, what can I do to get my children to listen to the Word on these last days? They all believe in the Lord, but they won't uh, take heed to these last days' signs. How can I uh, be happy without uh, my children? Well, you're, you're going to have your children, uh, they, you keep living the life you are. You're doing good, I can tell. And that sets an example that they have, they, they see this. And they know that God blesses you. And, and also, um, we know as God's elect, and it's obvious you are, that in the millennium, you're going to recognize them as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 20 through 25. You're going to know them. You're even going to be able to help them. They'll listen to you then if they have not between. Meanwhile, but just keep being patient, long-suffering, and let God have his way. Okay, Bu and Tom from, from Washington. My husband and I enjoy your broads. Thank you. Uh, and... Um, I've got two questions. How does the Bible state that man was created in our image, plural, when there was only one God? Well, you missed the first earth age. And when you miss the first earth age, you've got blinders on because you don't know what happened in the first earth age. That's when Satan rebelled. That's when he fell, and he took a third of God's children with him. That's when God's elect were chosen. And what it says in Genesis 1.27, let us create man in our image. That we were all there. Where, where do you think you came from? You came from God. And you were with him. And, um, and as you know and love the truth, which I can tell you were with him even in that first earth age, uh, I, I would recommend that um, if you have a companion Bible, you read Appendix 146 the foundation of this world. But it, and if you don't, you need to order my work on the three earth ages. You need to get cracking, okay? Demetrius from North Carolina. Why do people see people who have long since died? Well, it's loved ones. So you, you cannot help but think of them. And, um, and you will see them. They will, it would seem almost like a visit from them. Uh, but most of us have had this happen to us at one time or the other. And um, I, I believe at the same time, as I said earlier in this program, that it is an act of love on that person's part to let you know they're fine, they're all right, they're with the Lord, and, and uh, likewise. Uh, but it is, a human, it is human nature that when you love someone and they're gone, you can't help but miss them and that in itself, because of the natural order of things, can cause you to dream about them. James from Mississippi. Is there a verse in the Bible that says if a man finds a good wife, he has found a good thing? Absolutely. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Proverbs 18, 22 states exactly that. If, if, a, if a man finds a good wife, he's found a good thing because it's a blessing from God. Sherry from Indiana, once you anoint a person or a home with olive oil, do you have to do it again or just keep praying? Well, one thing, you want to always keep praying, you know, but 
Many times when you anoint a home and order anything evil out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then if some person comes to your door and knocks and you invite them in and they have a bad spirit, you invited them in. They're free then to come in. So it's whoever's in your house that have has access and travel. If, if um, you can cleanse your house with the oil of our people, but as long as you keep inviting, there's one way you can prohibit that. And I call it, it may sound a little strange, but I call it piggybacking. Is when you anoint that house in the name of Christ order, any evil spirit cannot piggyback on any person that comes into your home, that they got to park them outside. Then that in itself will kind of cover that. Then many people make that mistake. I just mentioned it in passing. Uh, Jim from Alabama. Um, I'm proud to be a member of your cult. Well, uh, we're proud to have you as a member of our church. You know, a cult doesn't, it does a person's thinking for them. And there's one thing we do in this church. We strive to make people think for themselves. If I, you know, if I drive people into the Word of God, I've accomplished what I intended to. In other words, many might say, well, I, I'm going to prove him wrong. Well, I, I hope you do, you know, to make a stab at it because, uh, and I know, Jim, you're not trying to, but some people do. It drives them into the Word of God, and then we've succeeded. That's what we want to do is to drive people into the Word is if, uh, and to think for themselves. If our sins are forgiven and off the hook books, how are we judged on the judgment seat? If we are destined for heaven, the only records kept uh, of our, are our good deeds. Well, not necessarily. If you haven't repented for all your sins, there might be one or two still stacked up there. But you see, judgment can be good also. In other words, the good deeds, that's what judgment is about. You've got a payday coming. And, and uh, certainly I, I hope you expect rewards for it, you know, and God's love because you're going to get it. But um, this is why that we want to keep repenting and make sure you print, repent of all your sins so that they're erased from that book and, and your good deeds. As a matter of fact, there is a scripture that stipulates that um, your good deeds will cover a multitude of sins. So... You want to keep those good deeds there and let payday keep coming because it's going to. That's what judgment is about for God's elect. Joyce from Oklahoma. My question is, will I be strong enough to resist the Antichrist and his evil spirits? I pray for help to be strong enough to resist evil and to help my family to be saved. Keep me in your prayers. You're, you're one of God's elect. You're a woman of God. A woman of God is strong because with God strengthens you. You don't, don't even let any doubt slip into your mind about that. You know, this is why God placed uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They weren't even singed. God loves his children and he takes care of them. You don't have anything to fear. Uh, Satan does. He can, he can, Satan can be afraid of Joyce because she's a daughter of the living God. Christ right with her. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So you are a strong woman. You hang in there. Uh, Carol from California. My question is, can we influence the coming presidential election with prayer? And do you think Father knows who will win? Well, the best way, prayer never hurts anything. But the best way you can have an influence on the election is to vote. I don't care what your persuasion you need. If you don't vote, then you don't really have any say in it. So every, especially every Christian should vote. Big time. Jerry from Texas. Do all the people on the right side of the Gulf have it to go through the millennium? God bless you, you and your family. You're so welcome, Jerry. Um, yeah, they're teachers. They're, they're God's elect are teachers through the millennium, and those on the right side 
some of them will be teachers also. Well, see, God not only has the elect here, but there's a remnant that's gone on. What is the remnant? It's somebody that knew the truth and were in good standing, and, uh, and God will bring them with him. He's bringing an army back with him, and that army is powerful. And certainly many of them will teach as God needs them in the millennium. They're there. They will be uh, servants of the living God. Lisa from Tennessee. It's a, I, I love the opportunity to watch you every evening. Well, thank you. Uh, thank God I am a faithful seed sower into a ministry. Every day I receive two or three letters from different ones wanting money, telling me to do this and I will receive a blessing from the Lord. My question is, is it wrong for me to toss the letters in the trash or should I try and give what I can to each one? God doesn't send out beggars, okay? If, if, if you receive a letter, somebody's begging, some ministry begging for money, they can't cut it on their own. They got to beg for money. And God, that's one thing he said when he sent out the 70. Do not beg. Don't, don't take a script or a purse with you. One of those is a begging bag. Just don't take a begging bag with you. So you can't buy a blessing from God, and you only, you tithe where you're fed, okay? Fed what? The Word of God. So you don't have to feel bad about uh, throwing a be beggar's letter away. No, that's where it belongs. I'm just winning friends and influencing people, but that's God's way, and I'm a teacher of God's Word. Barb from Ohio. Does the amount of prayer for a sick family member affect God's will toward healing the, that person? Praying all day long with, while at work, driving, cooking, uh, uh, compared to uh, on my knees prayer at night, we love you and appreciate you. Barb from Ohio. Prayer, prayer is always good, and, and God hears all, of, he hears all of your prayers. As it's written in the great book of Revelation, uh, God has, there's a vow that has all the prayers in it. God knows. He hears them. But um, faith is what really does it. Okay. It's having faith in him along with the prayer, all right? We, we'll be praying with you, all right? You just hang tough. Berlin from North Carolina. Um, I ordered a CD from you called Dreams and Visions. I heard you were in the Merchant Marine on the CD. I was a Navy gun crew on one of the ships, and I wonder if you ever served on one of these. No. I was never on one of the... I was in the Merchant Marines only a short time. It was right at the close of of World War II, and, um, uh, but I knew many of the Navy gunners, and they were all good troopers, so it's good to have you with us. God bless you. And we're going to go with uh, Susan from North Carolina. Uh, many of you have heard me say I was in the United States Marine Corps. Th this was my first experiences uh, out of high school was uh, in the Merchant Marines, and wanting to get a little experience from World War II. And so it was. Susan from North Carolina, I hope you, I hope you can answer my question. I am confused. I thought that number seven meant abomination. I was told it meant completion. <coughs> well, abomination is sure incorrect. Because seven not only means completion, it means spiritual completeness, meaning you're, you're going to have that completeness that uh, you know and deserve, spiritually speaking, and, uh, and so it is. This is why that seven is often used as, how, well, as God would say in Romans chapter 11, I have set aside 7,000 that shall not bow a knee to Christ. Uh, that shall buy, buy, not buy, I need a bail. But then in my mind switch to the seventh trump, which that's Christ coming. It's good, it's spiritual completeness, because that's when Christ returns. And of course, eight is new beginnings, and uh, eight is the millennium where we all have new beginnings. 
But seven means spiritual completeness as it is utilized in God's word. Seven <coughs> in Hebrew means the oath, like an oath of God. Uh, and what does 12 mean? And 12 means governmental uh, perfection also. There were 12 tribes that made up the houses of uh, Judah and the house of Israel. <coughs> and uh, within that, we have completeness. Now, your other question, the third one, was did God create only 12 billion souls? And if so, where can I find read on this? When you heard me say that, which you probably have, I said there are approximately half the people living now that have been since the beginning of time. So if there are six billion souls now living, and there are, then that would mean that God had created approximately 12 billion souls. You won't be able to read that anywhere. It's just that that number 12 governmental uh, perfection uh, still hangs in there, and God knows his children, and, and so it is. Uh, okay, we're out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy God's letter, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But you know something? Most of all, God loves you for reading it, for studying it, for absorbing it. You make his day when you cover the letter that he has sent to you to educate us <clears throat> in how to be pleasing to him. You make his day, and boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings, if we have helped you. You help us keep adding to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me. Listen good now. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Still a good day. Why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back to some basics today. We're going to teach a little bit from the book of Revelation. We're going to title it, as you see there, The Seven Seals and the Seven Trumps. Now, never let any man tell you that the book of Revelation is not to be understood because the very word itself 